Good morning. Thank you for joining us for today's Mobile Master Chat. I'm Amy Lensing Tate, and it's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the UWM Alumni Association and introduce Margaret Newton, Director of UWM's Electa Quinney Institute for American Indian Education. The focus of the Institute is to strengthen and celebrate American Indian education at the local, regional, and national level with strong connections to Indigenous teaching practices around the globe. The Electa Quinney Institute has endowed professorships in the School of Education with a strategic plan and vision for connecting American Indian programs at UWM with the Milwaukee and Wisconsin community. In addition to leading the Institute, Margaret is also a professor in the English department and in American Indian studies. She's a poet and author of several publications, in addition to serving as the editor of Ojibwe.net. She also teaches the Anisha Bimoan language at UWM. We'll have ample time for questions today, so please enter those into the chat window at any time. And now I'll turn things over to Margaret. That's how we would say good morning here in this place. Uh, it's wonderful to be able to talk to everybody. I have just a few things that I thought I would share with folks on the topics that typically we try to say are important to everyone on our campus as they think about our identity as an indigenous uh, place here in the Great Lakes. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to show everybody was a view from above. I think that we have a way to see that the view of the Great Lakes uh, from the sky. It's something that no matter where you are, uh, even if you were in outer space, you would be able to see this feature on Earth. There's nothing else like it. You can see one of the largest systems of fresh water on the planet, and you can see the largest island, um, uh, the Manitoulin Island up there by Lake Huron. And what's important here is that these lakes have existed for about 10 or 12,000 years, and they've changed over time. Lake Huron, scientists tell us, uh, was once one lake. And the indigenous stories of the region also echo that scientific knowledge by talking about caribou hunting and sudden floods and the way people lived in and around the lakes long ago. So one of the things that we try to teach folks uh, in our American Indian Studies program is how to think about this place both from an indigenous standpoint and from a scientific standpoint. So as we protect this space, we all know as home, the Great Lakes, uh, we are doing it in all of the ways that we can. And we really are having everybody have this as a shared source of identity. A lot of the cities here were cities for many, many years. You can see on this, this map exactly where Milwaukee is. You can also see where Chicago, Detroit, a few of the other big cities are. And those are places where rivers and bays have caused natural gatherings for many, many years. So we think of our city as having a, a starting point, but really we try to teach that the starting point for some of these gathering spaces is much, much longer even than the nations that currently exist. Um, the, the other thing I'll show you is a map of Milwaukee from the early 1800s. I think we can look at that as well. So this is a, a wonderful map that I encourage people to take a look at if they get a chance. It's a map easily found online through the Wisconsin Historical Society. Um, it's a map done by Increase Lapham. When he came to the region and started talking to people about who had lived here. And you had considerable presence in the area. You can see on this map, for people who are familiar with the landscape of Milwaukee, you can see the island and you can see the Bay of Milwaukee and that island, Jones Island, if you were to zoom in on the map, you would see there are little dwellings. You also see little dwellings up the Milwaukee and Menominee River. And those were places that people were living and gathering. And off toward the other side, you can see that there are little dwellings along the Kanikinik River. These three rivers that converge in this space were tended and used as transportation by the Ho-Chunk, the Potawatomi, and the Menominee for many, many years before Milwaukee became the city that it is today. And there are still many Ho-Chunk, Potawatomi, and Menominee folks in the city. Uh, Milwaukee is a city that has more American Indian folks per capita than any other city east of the Mississippi. So this presence, this map that you're looking at from 1835, which looks so different than the map we might see of Milwaukee today, it's actually connected. You see that uh, there are still Menominee folks living and working in the city. 
the Ho-Chunk have a big presence. There are now 12 sovereign nations in Wisconsin, and you have some people like the Oneida, the Stockbridge Muncie, who were removed to this region uh, as the United States was changing the way the states were defined and the nation grew. And then there are people that have been here for a very, very long time. So the Menominee are maybe one of the oldest uh, tribes in the state, and there is only one Menominee nation. And you can even see that one from space as well, because they've tended a, a forest up in that region for a very long time. Uh, so this is just something, a little bit of a way to see this region from a different angle, from above to see how unique and amazing these Great Lakes are. We typically, if I were telling you in Anishinaabemwin, the language that I teach, Mampi Daya, Minoa King, Besho, Michigaming, I would say that I live and, and work in Milwaukee, the good land. That's literally what those words mean. Mino is good and Aki is land. And the place that we consider all these lakes where they intersect is Michigaming. It's just really the word is, it means the great sea. So it has come to be the name of one particular lake and a particular state in the United States. But what Michigaming means is the very, the vast place, the vast sea that really identifies this space on our planet. Um, the other thing that in our really short time together, I thought would be fun to share with everybody is a little bit about the language because many of us are working to preserve and, and hang on to our languages. They are not the primary language in the home anymore, but they are ways to remember who we are. And when we were talking about what we would share with you today, I came across this picture that you can see the snow on the ground, which here in the middle of summer, just after summer solstice is a really a, a cooling image. And that's uh, Kim Blazer, who was our Poet Laureate here in Wisconsin, and she and I are singing with Neali, who's a young woman who had come out with us, and we were singing near the Lake Park Mound, which is the only existing mound in the region now, and it's around 2,000 years old, and it is something that we always want to remember. Those are our friends from the Overpass Light Brigade, who you can see in the background. They are forming the word Mikwenim, which means to remember someone. And I always really try to make sure that people have the experience of using the language. Uh, anyone that has lived and worked in this region uh, is using the language all the time. Every time you say Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Kenosha, Waukesha, these are all words that are still a part of the language that we use today. And it's always fun for people to, I think, use them a little more and connect more meaning to those words. I explained Milwaukee as meaning Minowaking, the good land. Uh, Waukesha comes from the word for fox, both the fox as a, as a creature, but also the fox as a nation, as a group of people that have also got connections to this place. Kenosha is uh, the name for a particular type of fish, a, a pike, but it's also, if you looked at that map, one of those dwellings, uh, one of the spaces where you saw some of the little dwellings represented Ganoshigam's village. And that was a space that had upwards possibly of thousands of households. So when you think of what Milwaukee might have looked like at that time in the 1830s, there were, there were leaders that had history and culture and language that was thriving in the space and lots of communities around them. So when we look at the mound and we think that those leaders protected the mound and remembered people before us, we try to continue those traditions. And I've done a lot of Zoom teaching uh, since we've all experienced COVID. And in, in some ways it's been exciting and, and fun to connect with people who never would have walked into my classroom. And I am guessing that anyone who took time to show up this morning might be willing to learn how to sing something. So what I'll do, we've got a song here on the screen that is basically just a song about remembering. And you can see the Anishinaabem one words on the top with the English below. And I will go ahead and sing it. And the second uh, stanza there repeats at the end. You may get to the point where you say, I'm going to join in. You can also find the song later on Ojibwe.net. And that uh, website there is 
put there for people to share. Everything we put on there is stuff that we want to share, that we want others to just go ahead, have fun with and use. So I'll introduce this song to you. I hope that you will sing along. And eventually I hope that some of what I shared with you today is something that in the course of today or later this week or at some point, you'll share with someone else who is in your circle of friends or family. So here's the song that we sang the day that we were thinking of the mound and how long folks have been in this space. Mikwenda goes it up on a go sha. Mikwenda goes it up on a go sha. Go mikwena me go on a go bijiganak. Go mikwena me go in a way magina. Mikwenda goes it up on a go sha. Mikwenda goes it up on a go sha. I'm going to do the last part one more time just to encourage everybody to go ahead and use some Anishinaabem when in this space where it has been spoken for thousands of years. Mikwenda goes it up on a go sha. Mikwenda goes it up on a go sha. So I hope that will stick with you for at least a little while and echo uh, through your day. And I'm happy to be here and to take questions. Um, one of the questions that I often get is how do people learn the language today? And I did uh, hear mention at the start of Ojibwe.net, which is a website that I've edited for a couple of decades now. And it's just uh, something online where it's open source. People can dive in and hear these songs and learn the language as well. So we have questions. Um, the first is, are there places we can go to experience American Indian culture around Milwaukee? And my opinion is always everywhere. I mean, really anywhere that you are, there is a lot of history. Um, sometimes you have to dig a little bit. Uh, you can certainly be at the Lake Park Mound. That's one space. And if you look into that history first, you'll know what was there. Um, there are the sites where Angelique Leroy, um, who was a woman that came from Green Bay, and when she married Jacques Laveau, they settled the space, and you can now find some of the um, early trade sites that would have connected the Menominee Ho-Chunk and Potawatomi people. There are also some markers throughout the city. If you look up historical markers for Milwaukee, you will find some of uh, the spaces have, that have been uh, noted so that you can be standing by what seems to be a modern hotel in the middle of our city. And then you'll notice that in fact, it's a village site from long ago. So I, I would always say, you know, look back at some of the old maps, look at um, those things. There was a Indian summer in the past, which has changed a bit. And if you tune into um, things going on at the Indian Community School of Milwaukee, you'll see that they are working with some of the organizers of Indian summer to still hold public events. So there's powwows throughout the year and other teaching gatherings that people can still go to even though Indian summer has changed. Uh, so to give you a little more information about myself, if I were going to give you an introduction, I would say Minnesota, which is kind of to say that I'm originally from Minnesota. I uh, grew up hearing the language a bit. It is part of my background and I had a, a sense that I should learn to speak the language of my ancestors. But I also had a lot of support from uh, elders around me. So I'm part of the generation that uh, got to hear a lot of elders for sure. In Minneapolis, we still, at the time when I was growing up there, had a lot of people who held classes. We had some summer camps. I certainly got to hear the language a lot. But I grew up in the city and we did not speak the language at home. It's been five generations since anybody in my family was fluent in the language. And then I really dedicated my life to trying to reclaim that. Um, our family is from Grand Portage Lake Superior Band of Chippewa, but then also from the Ontario Métis. 
So people will sometimes say, well, which are your family names for, in our case, it's the Hills, the La Valleys, the Moplaziers. It gives you a sense of um, who we were and, and how that trade culture um, mixed with our, our culture around the Great Lakes. And the other thing that I'm always really happy to be able to share is both of my daughters grew up hearing the language and singing these songs and using it. Um, recently, my oldest graduated from college and the youngest will be entering college next year. And it's really been a delight to see that with some effort, I believed what all my teachers told me, which was teach your children. If you're gonna learn, teach your children as you are learning. So um, in my family, we've done that. So I'm, I'm happy to say we've got the language at least moving forward one more generation. Um, I hope, you know, if that's helpful for folks to know a little bit, it is, it is definitely possible for people to reclaim those connections. Um, and it, uh, so then the next question is about the American Indian languages in Wisconsin. And I always have to remind myself, right, these are small settings. I could talk to you for hours just about that. But I work with the Indian Community School in now in Franklin. And at that school, um, the board there has really taken the initiative to attempt to protect the languages of this space. And so with a very skilled uh, group of people there, um, we've got people who are teaching Ojibwe. The folks in that classroom are really dedicated, very fluent people who are connected to their culture, connected to the sovereign nations of the state. And you would find that Ojibwe is the strongest language in the region. Uh, Michael Zimmerman Jr. who teaches Ojibwe there can also speak Potawatomi and has worked with the Forest County with their language. So Ojibwe and Potawatomi, um, are connected related languages. Ojibwe is stronger, but Potawatomi has a reasonable foothold. They're doing their best. We also teach Menominee at that school, which is perhaps the most threatened language in our state. Menominee as a nation were terminated. That's a, a history you can look up and see how that entire nation was technically terminated and lost their identity and their social infrastructure. And so today, the Menominee nation is the uh, most disadvantaged economically, educationally, and socially of anywhere in our state. I mean, and that actually includes, you know, parts of Milwaukee that we might think of as most economically challenged. Uh, the average income on the Menominee Nation is 14,000 per year. So it's a group where their focus has not been uh, culture. They haven't been able to focus on that, but they now have a group that have been working uh, to save their language and they're making great progress and they do have a increasing number of speakers, but by that I mean it's changing from maybe five to 15, and, and so they've got a lot of work to do. The Ho-Chunk Nation, completely different uh, story there as well. The Ho-Chunk Nation was removed a bit to the west and is now coming back and much more present in the state. Again, there's so much history that I'm um, really kind of collapsing for you to answer the question about language, but they also have a language commission and they're working on restoring their language. Uh, they have a lot of support, particularly from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which has realized uh, that some of the mounds in their space are mounds that the Ho-Chunk protected and watched. Uh, they belong to people even before the Ho-Chunk, but the Ho-Chunk presence really from Green Bay across the state to kind of the La Crosse area is something that people are beginning to remember and, and connect with language as well. So we have those languages, it's three different language families. Um, actually, the other one I did not mention is Oneida. Um, so Oneida, as I talked about in, at the start here, they are removed to the region. So they are um, of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and they would have been out east. They're connected to the nations out there. Their language is Iroquoian and they also have worked to you know, revitalize their language. So you have Oneida, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Potawatomi, and Ojibwe, those are the languages around here. You will often hear Anishinaabe or Ojibwe the most because it's probably got the highest number of speakers of all those languages. Um, so the Lake Park Mound, uh, I know to get to it from campus, if you are standing near campus and you walk toward the lake, the Lake Park Mound is, um, it's in Lake Park. I'm doing a bad job explaining it off the top of my head, but you'll see it if you go there. It is not a large marker or a high marker. If you uh, are at 
uh, Lake Michigan and you are at the shoreline, if you follow Lake Drive and you, um, you can see Lake Park is sort of nestled between kind of where Downer is and where Lake Drive is and, and you can visit that mound and it's just something that I think a lot of people don't know. Kletch Park also has some mounds, um, small sort of uh, archaeologic evidence of people having a trail through this area and really moving around in different ways. Now we have highways and um, ways to get through our city and define our lives um, in terms of business and, and uh, where we live. You would have traditionally had people really focusing on the confluence of those three rivers. And a lot of times along the river or along the lakeshore were burial areas. And so that's why the mounds would be in those locations. Uh, so the Kinnikinick, I love that word. So the Kinnikinick River is going through Milwaukee and we have the road that everyone knows as well in our city, Kinnikinick, which comes from a word Kinnikinike, which is to mix things up. Um, that's a verb and it's something you could do, create a mixture or mix things together. But the significance of that is many people from this area would be familiar with uh, what we call red willow or red osier dogwood. And that's a kinikinic plant. If you process it at the right time of year, you can actually create a little mixture that you then let it age. And that would be what people in this region would have smoked or used in ceremonies. Um, you know, similar to the way incense is used, not something that people would be smoking on a daily sort of um, basis the way people smoke tobacco now, but the kind that you would use when you maybe get together and you want to say a prayer together or start a gathering together, a political or religious ceremony. So having some kinikinik, having that item that you might smoke or offer to others, exchange, I still know folks today that when they get together, they've got their own little special mixture of kinikinic where it's got some of that base dogwood in it, but sometimes other herbs in it as well. And those are the things that people would exchange as gifts and, and as a way of forming alliance. We all know that gifts are some of the things that help forge friendships and, and keep people connected. So to me, when people say kinikinic, I think of mixtures, I think of gift giving, I think of gathering. Um, and I, I honestly hope that's one of the things that can come back a bit so that everybody, when they're driving down that road, thinks of the way our city is really a mixture of cultures. So many people, layers and layers of different cultures now and languages that have been, become a part of this place. Not sure if we have other questions um, or we'll come close to the end of time here. But uh, it is nice to think of people learning more about the region and feeling connected to it in a, a different way. Uh, one question about how can we find out more information. There is a, a book that a lot of people sort of go to as a good beginning volume. Um, Patty Lowe has written a book that if people want to use it, uh, it's written at a very basic level. We use it even sixth grade and on up about the history of the tribes. But I would also encourage folks to really take time and think of the nation closest to you and then look at their website and look at the history they have posted and look at the events that they have throughout the year, almost every nation now, certainly all the nations here in Wisconsin, they have tribal historic preservation officers and they often have archives, they have museums, they have gatherings, some of which are now becoming virtual. They have ways to let folks know we're still here, we're still um, active and protecting our culture and the identity of this space. So if you want a, an easy, quick, read, I would suggest Patty Lowe's book as a great place to start. Um, but then you can get into other things as well. Susan Sleeper Smith has written books about Native women and the fur trade, which is another fascinating way to look at things. Victoria Brem has come up with a volume that is some of the literature and poetry of the place. Um, there are ways where you can start digging into the stories and songs and, and history here. And I I really encourage folks to just get to know which nation is closest to you. We might have some people today listening from very different places, but it doesn't matter where you are in the world, there's gonna be some sort of history prior to the um, contemporary cultures, even you know, 
the Ojibwe, we would look back and say, there were certainly people here before us, and we would need to know that history. It's a part of moving forward um, in the world and feeling connected to both the past and, and the future we might be building. And uh, Electa Quinney, uh, the EQI Institute is named after Electa Quinney, who is a Stockbridge Muncie woman that was the first school teacher in the state. Um, and she was in this area before the state really was the state of Wisconsin. So she was removed to this place as a Stockbridge Muncie woman from the east and she came here and saw that there were native children from the Menominee, Potawatomi nations, mostly in the area that she was, and there were settler children. Um, at the time it would be mostly German children that she was encountering and she created a classroom that was diverse and connected everybody and she just felt that the children needed to learn and it, as she saw the territory developing and changing she responded to that need. So our institute is named after Electa Quinney, who was the first school teacher in this place we now call Wisconsin. So the, the sustainable forestry maintained by the Menominee is incredible. It's amazing. Um, they have the Menominee Nation now has their status as a sovereign nation restored and that sustainable forestry business is something that people from other countries worldwide often come to visit. And what they do is work with that forest to not only prevent forest fires and harvest lumber as needed, but to maintain the entire ecosystem related to the health of that forest because they understand that that is related to the life and health of everyone around it. So the Menominee Nation also has a tribal college and with that tribal college, they have a sustainable um, institute. So they're often thinking about sustainability and all of the ways that a forest is part of human culture and an entire ecosystem it's something that um, many researchers have worked with to connect modern science to some of the work going on that has been centuries of, I guess, really centuries of learning up in that forest area. Probably getting close to our time. A final question. All right. Um, yeah, you know, I think there are attempts to have more interpretive signage. We would love that. The fourth graders at the Indian Community School recently worked really hard to have one of the parks in Milwaukee change its name um, from Columbus Park. Columbus hadn't been up here, and so they felt it might be nice to have it be Indigenous Peoples Park. And, and there are ways that we can connect better and remember this place. I think that this the children at that school had some ideas about what else could happen. And there's also ways that I think at our institute, I've got a couple of graduate students that are also looking at how can we share the history and culture about the place a little more. Um, we also work with a lot of teachers. So I have many teachers who look at the website and use it. I guess maybe one last recommendation I would make is for all the folks who remember reading the Laura Ingalls Wilder Little House on the Prairie series, um, take a look at Louise Erdrich's Birch Bark House series because she wrote that to respond to the question a lot of us that might have had when we read Little House in the Big Woods and you hear Laura saying that there was nothing here. And then you look at where she was, she really would have been in the backyard of what is now La Couture Nation, um, Red Cliff, Bad River. You would have a lot of Ojibwe people up there that just weren't visible to the settlers initially. And as you read the Little House in the Prairie series, you see Laura encounter native culture, um, but in a very limited way and in a way that was a, a bit problematic. So Louise Erdrich wrote a book, Birch Bark House, and uh, it really, tells the story of settlement in this region from the eyes of an eight-year-old Ojibwe girl. So I think there are a lot of ways that people can start to rethink um, and reteach our history in a different way. So we come to time, and I guess I just want to say uh, thank you so much to everybody who took time to listen today. Thank you so much, Margaret, for sharing your time and expertise with our alumni today. It was a great opportunity to connect with Milwaukee's Indigenous roots, and we'd love to have an opportunity to have you in the future for a longer format discussion, if you're willing to. 
Um, so this was the final chat in our spring series of Mobile Master Chats. We'll be taking the summer off and surveying our audience to learn what topics, links, and mediums are best for these presentations. So please make sure to take the time to fill that online questionnaire out and share your input with us as we're hard at work developing our topics for the fall season. Thanks for watching today and remember that archived versions of the entire series are available on the alumni website on demand anytime. Thank you.